Everybody can hear me? Good, because I can be louder, as Zeki will tell you about those car rides. And the, uh, the deal was we, hi we always hire a bunch of interns from Berkeley, Stanford, and a couple of the uh, lesser schools on the East Coast, um, and uh, like where I went. Um, and obviously, a lot of you guys don't have cars and, and don't want to schlep down to Silicon Valley, so I volunteered to drive Zeki and another intern down every day. And I think their vocabulary of bad words like expanded by about <laughs> 600%. Uh, partially because of this deal I was working on with Reiner. Reiner not only is um, one of my sort of most important colleagues and uh, one of the most special people I know, he's also one of my best friends. We met um, in the summer of March 2012. March 2012, spring of 2012. Uh, his daughter, Johanna, was two and a half, and his daughter, Sophia, was minus uh, four months. Um, Came into my office, uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend um, to tell me about this new startup that he was starting called Marine Explorer and to ask me if I knew anyone in Silicon Valley who would be interested in investing. By the end of the meeting, not only did I give him a key to the building, but we asked to invest as well because I thought anybody who would leave um, a young daughter, a pregnant wife back in Estonia, which is on the other side of the world in the Baltics, anybody who had such a phenomenal vision of connecting data and information technology to the environment was really well worth funding. And his endeavor uh, really gave me great hope about this new generation of entrepreneurs that really cared about the planet. A few years earlier, a lot of the investments we had been making had been in things like digital music, uh, video technology, um, and, and, and you know, projects like that, which, you know, okay, we all love video, but you know, that ain't exactly going to save the earth. So we invested in Planet OS. Um, Reiner moved to the US, set up in the back of our building, built a great team back in Tallinn. Christian and Ilya are part of that team. And we clucked along. Now, fast forward, um, what Planet OS was doing became so harmonic to what Intertrust itself was doing that at one point we decided, let's get both of the companies together. Let's acquire Planet OS and Intertrust. And today, Planet OS is a wholly owned subsidiary of Intertrust. It's very much focused on geospatial big data. Uh, we kept planetos.org, which Ilya uh, operates, uh, running to enable projects like this, but also people around the planet doing big data research on geospatial phenomena. Um, I was going to not give a presentation with slides and just you know, declare this uh, a happy day and send everybody on to do their homework. But um, I, I started looking through all the slides I had. And as an aside, I'm probably the laziest person you'll meet, like at least this year. So what I did was I just took a, a bunch of slides from some past presentations. I threw them together. And one thing you'll learn when you give lots and lots of presentations in your life, you could literally, at random, pick slides out of a bag, put them together, and they'll tell a story. It may not be the right story, but they'll tell a story. So uh, let me tell you really quick about Intertrust in case you haven't heard today. We're an ancient company. We're 30 years old. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, I think, was six when we were founded. Um, and the guy who founded the company was just this tremendous visionary. It wasn't me. It was a tremendous visionary who saw that the way operating systems were written for a highly distributed world where computers talk to each other over open networks like the net, uh, operating systems weren't built right. Because the idea of securing data and, and making data available to people um, on networks like the internet was not going to work if the only security technology you had at your disposal was a lock and a door. In the old days, you used to lock computers in a room. So this guy, his name is Victor Scheer effectively came up with a new way of building an operating system, which to all of you who study computer science is what? They did it differently? The, the, but you know, if you look at .NET, if you look at Windows, if you look at iOS, or all of those operating systems are based on principles we invented where data and code are persistently protected and managed. And people and processes that touch um, things in the environment are authenticated. That's like second nature. That's an app store. Well. This guy, Victor Scheer, and his original team in the early 90s were actually the folks who came up with these ideas and founded the company based on that. Now, you know, today we're kind of responsible for this field of computing called distributed trusted, uh, trusted distributed computing. 
Um, when I joined the company in 1997, I used to be a researcher um, in a lab that the Japanese company NEC uh, funded uh, in Princeton, right on the edge of campus. Um, we had a bunch of ideas. We did a lot of research. I mean, we've always done a lot of research. Our chief scientist, by the way, has a Turing Award, which is pretty rare for a company with 200 people. Um, we didn't really have an application. So, oddly enough, the, the application we first came up with, the first product we made, had nothing to do with climate data, had nothing to do with IoT, it had nothing, it was digital rights management, the technology that makes you pay for Spotify. And uh, that turned out to be one of the early use cases for these types of technologies on the internet. Fast forward, um, 20 plus 25 years later, um, our stuff's being used everywhere, and our stuff is not only being used to protect things, but very, very importantly, it's used to share things. Because while most people think of security about as being like inside, outside, lock people out technology, if it's applied correctly in the OS and in the network, it's about inclusion and interoperability. It's about people who are supposed to see stuff getting to it, and people who aren't supposed to see stuff not getting to it. So today we're very, very focused on a very broad set of applications. We're active in entertainment and media. We're active in the energy space. We're active in the space you guys have been working on for a while. We're active in automotive and healthcare. And Planet OS plays a really important role in all of this. How many of you guys uh, can read and write? I think probably most of you, right? You made it this far. Um, so you're all familiar with the, the horsemen of the apocalypse, right? So the, uh, the third, who knows what the third horseman is? The clue is the, ta the picture of the tapestry in the back. Famine. So these slides I cribbed from a talk I gave uh, four years ago at uh, the London Zoo. The London Zoo, aside from being a really good zoo, uh, has a research uh, society. And they invited me, a bunch of biologists invited me to come and speak about, um, well, anything I wanted to. Um, so I gave a talk called The Big Data of Food. And it was about food security and how we can use uh, data to understand agricultural trends uh, around the planet, understand how we can feed the planet, and so on and so forth. And, you know, English people tend to be more educated than we are. I decided to, to kick off with something erudite. So uh, we started, I started talking about some demographic trends, but also some issues related to food and food security and agriculture. By 2050, the world's population is slated to be over 9 billion people. Uh, when I was at Johanna's age, there were about 2.5 or 3 billion people on the planet. And I can still remember being told that there would be 6 billion people on the planet by the year 2000. And just, you know, couldn't imagine what that meant. Now we're well on the way to 7 or 7 plus. Uh, most of these people are going to be living in the wrong place. They're not going to be living in places with water. They're not going to be living in places uh, with fertile land. In fact, if you use some of the Planet OS data, look at where the most farmable land in the world is, you'd be amazed at how little land on the planet is actually farmable uh, in a productive way. Uh, if it wasn't for the kind of stuff you guys have been working on for the last two days and for technology, the human race would be screwed. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few slides. The other issue is, even in countries like the United States, food and population centers may not be as close as you want them to be. Uh, if you look at a map of the United States, and you look at, and it's not in, you can find the talk I gave at, at, in London on the internet somewhere, but if you look at the United States, and you look at where people grow stuff and where people eat stuff, um, most people in the U.S. live in big cities along the coast, and, or at least on the perimeter of the country, and most of the food in the United States is grown on the inside, in the middle. Why is that? Well, the population of the United States boomed in the 1950s. The United States became really prosperous after the Second World War, and we developed several things, gasoline, trucks, and the highway system. So it made a lot of sense in a world with cheap gas to have stuff grown in the middle and then trucked to the, the edges of the country where everybody lives. Now, 
the price of gas is, is, goes up, the price of food goes up. Um, the population start tapping uh, agriculture. We need to drive more trucks to the edges of the country. That increases the carbon footprint. Carbon footprint goes up. It gets harder to uh, grow stuff. Um, that's a very, very negative cycle. Location of farming, the way we move stuff around, and the way we distribute food today, not just in the United States, but globally, does not work. It will not scale. How many people studying economics here? Aside from intertrust employees. One economist. You know, you know who this guy is? This is uh, Malthus. Um, so he's the guy who basically, I'm an engineer, so I'll give you the engineer's version of this, which is if we overpopulate the planet, we're either going to kill each other or natural causes are going to come in and wipe us out. It, it, it's an equilibrium system. You'll grow up to a point, the equilibrium can't support it. People will either turn on each other uh, or um, things like disease and famine will kick in. The actual population kept equal to the means of subsistence by misery and vice. I gave this talk, you know, the engineer who flew in from the United States and, you know, started talking to a bunch of biologists and they, this, this one guy at the end, was, I forgot, he was some fancy professor from one of the English schools, made a really interesting point in the Q&A. He, he, he drew an analogy between um, a wheat harvest in China that, that missed its numbers and the Arab Spring and the refugee problem in Europe. Apparently, there, there's a, a couple papers written on this. Apparently, a couple of years before the Arab Spring, the Chinese missed their wheat harvest because of weather issues. And they had to start buying wheat on the global uh, wheat markets. And of course, the price of wheat shot up, which increased the price of bread in the Middle East. Bread is a staple in a lot of Arab countries that triggered the riots in Tunisia and on and on and so forth, of course. You, you've all read the news, you all know the stories, people started to migrate into Europe. So those who think they can build a bubble around their rich country are totally wrong. We live in a completely interconnected world where the model of nations, which is an anachronism from the 19th century uh, Napoleonic era, is breaking down. You guys all have more in common with your Facebook friend 9,000 miles away than you do with the neighbors you probably grew up next to in whatever town you, you lived in in the United States. That's just a fact of life, and that genie ain't going back in the bottle. So unless we want these Malthusian forces to kick in, we got to get smart. We're either going to destroy our way out of the problem, or we're going to invent our way out of it. And you know, being an engineer, I, I've always believed that um, technology can be put to good use and solve even the deepest, greatest problems. It's a quote by Mao. The rest of this is not a very happy quote, so I left it out, but a revolution is not a dinner party. The Green Revolution in India was pretty much what allowed India to grow to its current size. In, in, in the 1940s and 50s and even before, India suffered from phenomenal famines. Now, India is a, it's, it's, it's a fairly rich country agriculturally, but it has phenomenal population issues even, you know, relative to the time back 50, 100 plus years ago. And it has phenomenal weather trends. If a monsoon misses in India, the rice harvest gets whacked. Um, so in the 1960s, the Indians put in place a series of agricultural planning processes that, that were called the Green Revolution. That, that brought dramatic changes um, in, in the way agriculture was conducted in that country. Uh, pesticides, fertilizers, farming practices uh, that were used um, out, outside India in the West were now employed. Farmers were trained to farm with technology, the technology of the time, and of course, um, that allowed um, a regulation and a stability and a smoothing of the variants uh, in, in, the, uh, in, 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 the, in the crop yields, which allowed the population to grow. Uh, the Green Revolution at the time was actually really controversial. This, this dude, Ehrlich, who's a, a, a famous demographer, economist, is this great, I love these quotes. I don't see how India could possibly feed 200 more people by 1980. Okay, who knows the population of India today? 
about 1.3 billion, right? Uh, last time I counted them. Um, there's, there's a similar quote about computers. I don't know if you, the, the global market for computers will never exceed like three or four or whatever, some, some guy at IBM. Um, this is my favorite counter quote to that. The report of my death was an exaggeration by Mark Twain. Um, so the, the Green Revolution did phenomenal things uh, in India, but what it's done today, fast forward to 1.3 billion people and the fastest growing economy in the world, um, is it's causing us to crush biodiversity. The overuse of pesticides and fertilizer uh, is, is, is begin, it generates a lot of food in the short term, in the medium and long term, can destroy ecosystems. We're farming the wrong things in the wrong places. There's all sorts of economic incentives to grow certain crops in certain places. That not only depletes soil, but it, it's, it's just the wrong thing to do. So what we really need now is a green counter-revolution. There is no free lunch. So I call this the I-Green Revolution. I hope there are no lawyers from Apple here. Um, Technology is going to play a, a vital role in this. And it's not just big data, data processing. That's super important. That's why we're here. But it's also going to be IoT and connected sensors. Intertrust just invested in a company called uh, Interplant, um, which you know, sort of marries biology and, and nanosensors and data platforms. Uh, they genetically modify plants to report either optically or electrically when they're infested, and they have these nanosensors and optical sensors that can detect the infestation weeks before you would normally know that. In case you're worried about eating one of these things, they're genetically engineered to be sterile, so they don't reproduce with the other plants. You put six or 10 of these in an acre, and the farmer will know that he's got sick plants long before um, he or she would have known before. So less pesticide, less fertilizer, all that good stuff. Um, Internet technology, these things would be, um, by example, internet technology, these things would be internet connected. So internet technologies are disrupting agriculture dramatically. They're also disrupting transport, um, retail, you know, all sorts of stuff. We are now in a position where we can analyze the food cycle from seed to stomach, which not only means you know, better crop yields, more targeted agriculture, uh, better environmental practices, it also means less food waste at the supermarket. I, I was, I, the, the same place I gave this talk, this, this guy from one of the big English supermarkets spoke after I did. I was shocked at how much stuff they throw away every day. It's disgusting. Um, with better IT technology, you can actually send signal back to the farm to modulate growth. You can, using big data and analytics, you can predict what you'll need when and where. That's what this weekend was kind of about. Um, of course, that comes with a price. If, if the internet knows exactly what I'm eating and when, that can be added to my mail and my uh, location and a whole bunch of other privacy violations uh, that make me just a cell in a spreadsheet in one of these big companies. So when you're thinking about this as you guys go on and you work in your careers and you start playing with data, there's always a dark underbelly to all of this stuff. And you've got to keep things like open society, democratic privileges, and privacy in mind when you're working with this stuff. And you can never lose sight of the 360 degrees uh, that bring science together with daily life. But anyway, back to why we're here today. All of this is all about data and big data and how we can use big data lenses uh, to look into data sets um, to see the patterns we need to do things better. Mobile data services enable internet connections. Um, I started to write um, a paper a few months ago uh, that was basically arguing that 5G was useless and we didn't really need it. You know, the, 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 uh, the title was going to be peak bandwidth. But then I started thinking about what you'd use 5G for and I just deleted it and went on my merry way. With, with technologies like 5G, uh, we'll be able to connect more and more and more things. Even though the, 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 the bit stream from small things is small, trillions of small things means lots of bit stream. Uh, Reiner's team at Planet OS started a project, I don't know if we talked about the Gwinty Moore, the wind farm stuff, but uh, if you guys heard about it, forgive me for repeating, but uh, 
they connected Planet OS to the largest offshore wind farms in the world. And uh, you can come to our office in Sunnyvale, and I'll drive you there and you can listen to me yell at the phone. Um, they c you can see in real time on one screen like the performance of every wind turbine uh, in this thing off in the Irish Sea. That's pretty cool. Uh, what's not cool is these wind turbines are like, what did Reiner likes to say, the size of a Boeing 737 or at least the length of one or something. They're huge. Uh, the, the blades. Um, they're connected with like basically RS-232, like 1970s um, computer connections. But, you know, you could slap like 5G cells on these things and, you know, just get much better, much more resilient, much more robust, much better weatherproof connectivity. And that will go down all the way to stuff that's clipped onto plants in a field somewhere. Uh, devices in fields, ocean satellites, mobile devices in your hands collect and transmit uh, data all over the place. And of course, you know, we're all wearing these things. But here's the upside to the downside. The downside to the upside is that the world is swimming in sensors and data. And when I met Reiner years ago, uh, the, the thing that resonated with me the most about the mission of Planet OS was that all of these sensors will generate tons of data, but we've had sensors generating tons of data for years and years and years, and apples look like penguins. And it's really hard, really, really hard to take a data set from a satellite that was thrown up in the 1960s and combine it with a marine drone that was launched off the coast of New Jersey last week. And what these guys did was create this big cloud engine that would suck in all these data streams, be they stored, be they real time, and transform them so they could be cross-analyzed. So apples look like apples and penguins look like penguins, and we could get inferences and answers. And that, to me, I thought was, was really deep, and that's why we got behind it. Now, it ain't all that rosy because, I mean, there's a lot of open problems um, in the space. And until a few years ago, data science was just basically a, ba a, a bag of stupid statistics tricks. Um, there is so much science, there is so much research that needs to be done for any of this to be meaningful. Lest we run the risk of creating these lenses that obscure what we're looking for or reshape it and cause us to act on ghosts in the data set. And, you know, I, I, one, of, one of my colleagues drew the, the cartoon. <laughs> but, you know, the bigger the dog gets, the better the fleas need to get. And I, I hope that, that you guys sort of work on these types of problems as, as you go straight forward. The, 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 the other thing is, you know, th those of you who studied like probability in the math department probably know that probability is it, it, it like when you're analyzing data from the real world, the probability distributions aren't that well behaved. There's very little in the universe that's linear or stationary. And when you start applying statistical techniques that are developed for stationary, ergodic, you know, all these fancy pants words you learn when you get a PhD, linear sources, and they're not, your, your, your inferences are all going to be wrong. So for those of you thinking of going off and getting PhDs and doing research in information theory or uh, probability and statistics, foundations of probability, there's some very, very cool open problems that over the years their solutions will transform into real world tangible analytics that can be used to solve very, very important problems. Um, I'm probably boring you guys to death, so I'm going to skip some of these slides, but the, the, the challenge uh, is really about finding the signal in the noise. And not only is it about writing the coolest, world's greatest data science analytics algorithm, but creating a system architecture that allows you to access data when and where you're supposed to get it. And that may not mean the data coming to your computer, but your computer going to the data. Because a lot of times the data sets are really big, they ain't moving. And a lot of times with DNA and with some of this geospatial stuff, the data is so sensitive, people aren't going to move it. So in order to solve that, we created this platform called Modulus. Um, I mean, this movie was probably made before I was born, but this is from like a famous Bruce Lee movie called Enter the Dragon. But, um, so Modulus is a, is a data architecture um, that uh, allows you to 
either collect data into a trusted intermediary or leave data in place and send analytics to it in a secure, trusted, and authenticated way. And uh, if you guys want to learn more about it, catch any of the Intertrust people. Reiner, after he joined Intertrust with Planet OS, took over the division that, that runs all of our data rights management platforms. Modulus is their flagship product. Um, Modulus provides you with cross-cloud interoperability, fine-grained data management, the ability to create trusted data exchanges, and very importantly, allows you to build digital business models on top of the data sets so people can actually monetize the cross-cloud uh, analysis that's taking place. This is being deployed today not only in those wind farms I talked about, but in the German uh, energy grid and shortly in some smart home systems around the planet. So, we're, as I said at the beginning, we're active in a lot of industries. I talked a lot about agriculture and food today, but um, energy is a big area for us. Um, we believe very, very strongly that uh, the energy world is going to go from electrons to bits. Uh, the energy industry, energy companies are going to become data driven. And we're working with two of the world's great energy companies today who are also our investors. Energy in Germany, which is about to merge with their a uh, big competitor and become the world's largest vertically integrated energy company. And uh, Origin Energy, which is Australia's uh, second largest energy company, um, we're working with them to deploy data-driven technologies for uh, energy. And that, you know, if anyone's interested in that, you can catch me after this, we can talk about some of that. But sky's the limit. Anywhere there's data being generated, people care about that data, it's going to get put into this technology at some point. And finally, I'll leave you with this. This is from, I don't know any New Yorkers here. This is from uh, Rockefeller Center, um, which I've been walking past since I was uh, a young child. Um, Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy time. This is all about data. This is all about your ability to manipulate data. This is all about using the technologies we're studying about to do good things in the world. Any questions? Great. Thank you.